Welcome everybody uh, to this seminar and uh, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of uh, the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies, to, uh, I'm glad to see you here. And uh, having managed to get here through the rain, uh, we, were not to, we can't say that we were lucky with the weather, but there's a good number of people here anyway, so uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, before I give the word to Morten Børos, uh, Kari Oslan, who will chair this session, will say a few words about the project uh, on which this uh, presentation is based. So, welcome to all of you, and please, Kari. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Kari Oslan. I'm a senior researcher at NUPI and also heading the Peace, Conflict and Development Research Group here. And uh, for your information, this seminar will be streamed. Uh, originally, we know that there were 100 people signed up to the seminar, so great that so many of you came, despite the horrible weather. Anyhow, so at today's seminar, findings from the EU Horizon 2020 funded project EU UNPAC will be presented. The, the project was coordinated by NUPI, and the principal investigator was research professor Morten Boos, who will talk after me. Um, very briefly, uh, just for your information, the project, I mean, you can go into to the homepage of NUPI and also EU UNPAC's homepage page if you Google that. But just a few words uh, about the project. It had 13 partners, Manchester University in the UK, Freie University in Berlin, SEPS in Brussels, Comenius University in Slavonia, Sant Anna in Italy, Belgrade Center for Security Policy in Serbia, Kosovo Center for Security Studies in Kosovo, National University of Kiev in Ukraine, CNRC in France, that's to say that it was IMRC in Tunis that was represented, Alliance for Rebuilding Governance in Africa Arga in Mali, Middle East Research Institute Mary in Iraq, and Areo in Afghanistan. And one of the main questions asked in the project was how the EU's crisis response has been shaped by the two gaps that the project analysed. Morten will talk more about that, but I was between intentions and implementation on the one hand and between implementation and local perception on the other. And to answer these questions, EU and PAC combined a bottom-up perspective with an institutional approach in order to deepen our understanding of how EU crisis responses function and are received on the ground in crisis areas. So to present the main findings, it's a great pleasure to introduce research professor Morten Boos. I was also going to present research professor Penilla Rieke, who was the leader of VP4, on the EU's crisis response and management, but she's unfortunately sick. Get well soon, Pernille, if you watch us here. Um, so after Morten's presentation, I will open up the floor for questions and comments. Morten, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Kari, and thanks to everybody who braved the weather to be with us this uh, morning. Uh, at least where I live at Ellingsrud, it was really quite terrible, and I guess that's the case all over the city. Anyway, I mean, I'm uh, happy that we also have been uh, you know, able, thanks to the um, uh, Center for Humanitarian Studies and to NUPI, to also uh, present some of the conclusions from this uh, project also here in um, Oslo and Norway. We have had a couple of uh, events also here, but uh, I must say that the ma majority of our uh, events has been uh, abroad in Brussels, but also a lot of uh, dissemination in the case countries, because that was important for us, that we also should feed back into local and national processes in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Mali, and so on and so forth, together with our uh, local colleagues. And I would also <laughs> like to say that uh, what we have done in places like Afghanistan, Iraq and Mali would not have been possible without our uh, local colleagues. Uh, and in this uh, presentation I will uh, first sort of do the bit that uh, Pernille was supposed to do, and that is sort of the more EU side to this. Uh, I, I will probably go through that a little bit quicker than uh, Pernille would have done in order to, to give <laughs> myself 
the opportunity to have a little more, um, bit more time to talk about our findings from the Sahel. And that's also the, the reason why we have called this presentation the EU in the Sahel from good intentions to Europe first question mark. We will be um, presenting. So the we will have some overall key findings and some specific key findings from the Sahel, although I mean there is quite an overlap here between the general findings and the findings from Sahel. They are not necessarily unique to this, but there is something particular with the Sahel and uh, its relationship to Europe that needs to be pointed out. And I think I will just start by pointing that out before I uh, delve into the um, into the project itself, and that is that when I started working in the Sahel uh, in around 2007, I mean, it was a place that nobody cared, uh, cared much about. It was not in uh, much of the major headlines. Uh, its position in EU foreign policy was very low. It was basically seen as sort of a lost space between uh, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And if it was something that the international community needed to, uh, to, to think about or care about, it could be taken uh, care of by France, basically. That has changed tremendously. This area sort of moved from obscurity to becoming high politics in most European capitals and also in Brussels. And there are a number of reasons from there for, uh, for this. Part of this is related to the crisis around Mali that sort of re erupted in 2012. Uh, with, with the case of Norway, it's also related to uh, in Amenas in uh, Algeria, um, an attack that was planned and uh, sort of performed from, uh, from Mali. But uh, for Europe itself, it's also very much related to what has been called very wrongly the European refugee crisis of 2014 2015. And Europe's attempt to deal with m waves of migration, and particularly this uh, was given primary attention when it dawned on, on people in Brussels that the majority of uh, arrivals at Lampedusa in, uh, in Italy from 2014, 2015 to 2016, the overall majority of these people had transited the Sahel Sahara through a town called Agadez in the northern part of Niger. And this has sort of catapulted this area into really becoming a top, top priority for security purposes, but maybe also for regime security purposes in Europe. It's a way of sort of protecting liberal European regimes against too much uh, waves of uh, what is called right-wing populism parties. Anyway, I'll get back to this, but uh, I hope this one works. Yes, it does. The starting point of this project is that for many years, the academic literature on the EU's engagement in external conflicts and crises were mostly concerned with what is called EU actorness. Researchers were perhaps overly concerned with what kind of actor the EU actually is trying to define and conceptualize it. And it was a whole lot of different views on this. Was this a soft power? Was this a smart power? Was the EU a civilian power, a normative power, cosmopolitan power, superpower or small power? Endless debates about this and they are still continuing. And while more attention has been given to the actual implementation of union policy, this research continues to be guided by a particular theoretical normative agenda, at least in according to me, and also in according to a lot of the researchers involved in EU and PAC. And I'll be a little bit provocative here, and this is sort of my criticism of EU studies in general, and that is that it's not necessarily the greatest idea that one particular phenomenon is by and large only studied by people who think that this particular phenomenon is the highest level of civilization that mankind has reached. That is not necessarily the best idea. I think that more people who are also skeptical and critical to the EU, in fact, should study the EU. I think that is much ne needed. And that is what we have tried to do with this project. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the views among EU and PAC researchers on, the Euro, uh, on, e on EU ranges from very supportive to quite skeptical and quite critical. And I think that has been good for the project that you had these mixed views on the phenomenon. 
Anyway, the aim of EU Unpack has been to break free from these label perspectives and unpack EU crisis response. And this has been done, as Kari said, through an, uh, an inductive and systematic empirical research that combined competences from peace and conflict studies and conflict studies with, uh, with insights from EU studies. I mean, in the original literature, there is two what's happened here? potential gaps in EU crisis response. One is the one between the intentions and implementation. Does it have the capacity to make decisions and respond with one voice to deploy necessary resources? And how are these uh, resources implemented on the ground by various EU institutions and member states? And then are related and very important questions. Do other actors, local and international, enhance or undermine the EU's activities? This is one important gap that has al already been identified in parts of the literature. The other important gap is the implementation local reception perceptions gap that we in many ways identified. And that is, does the EU have the capacity to be conflict sensitive or take local stakeholders views and competencies into account? And our argument was that the severity of these two gaps will give an indication of EU's impact on crisis management and its ability to contribute more effectively to problem solving on the ground. Our key findings is that the EU has considerably improved its capacity to act in response to various crises over the past years. That cannot be denied. However, the two gaps identified at the outset are still far from being bridged, and in this project we have also identified a third gap, a third gap that we believe is very important. It's the already mentioned intention implementation gap, it's the implementation perceptions gaps, but it's also, which dawned us very clearly, particularly when we did, uh, did a number of perception surveys among local beneficiary groups in all these, con all these case countries. And that is that there is an information local ownership gap. And it's a rather surprising gap between what the EU is doing and what the local actors knowledge and understanding about this engagement. And this is quite serious because the EU is involved in a number of crisis management operations around the world, taking in fact very important decisions concerning security sector reform, judicial reform, a number of these issues. And when you talk to, uh, when you interview local people about it, and we have not sort of done just a random sample of, uh, of people uh, randomly in the Mali, we have tried to sort of have a more, much more selected sample of people that in their cap working capacity or uh, other kinds of social capacities have quite a close encounter with the EU and should have uh, generally quite good views concerning what the EU is doing. And the overall answer is that we are not really certain what they are doing and why they are doing this here. But, it must, but they must be here for some reason, but we really don't understand it. And what this points to is really a democratic def deficit in these kind of crisis, external crisis management operations, that important decisions are taking without very much local involvement in them. And we believe this is a serious gap that needs to be addressed and questioned, because this is really about making plans for Nigel. How can you make plans for Nigel if Nigel is not involved in making then these plans? How can you create local ownership if people actually don't understand what you're trying to do in their countries. Don't see the point in uh, this way of doing security sector reform or other of these kind of things. So we believe that this is a very important gap that has not yet been properly studied, neither in the literature nor given much attention in the policy debate. If we turn to the very briefly on the int uh, intention implementation gap, the gap is getting smaller. The EU has improved its capacity to respond to crisis, but the remaining challenges are linked to higher uh, ambitions and uh, intentions and to have an integrated approach, which is difficult for the EU as for all other external, large external stakeholders. 
Limited resources, well, I mean, the EU is spending a lot of resources on its external operations and its crisis management operations, but still how to use this, eff uh, an effective use of existing operations and resources is still a major issue. Slow implementation, Brussels acts very slowly, and it's more reactive than proactive to crisis and crisis management. Competing interests is clearly an issue, and we see that also quite clearly in the case of the Sahel, where um, it's quite difficult sometimes to understand what is, uh, what is the EU and what is France, for example. And this is also in the case of Sahel further complicated by the fact that, that France is heading its own operations in this area, the anti-terror operation Barkhane, but it also sits on the, uh, on, the, um, on the Security Council of the UN and uh, in the, with its position in the UN it writes all uh, the um, major um, UN papers, uh, Security Council resolution papers on Mali and the Sahel and it's an important EU member, bilateral donor and also provides quite a lot of the backing for uh, EUTM, which is the huge, uh, relatively large EU military training operations in, uh, in this area. So what is what there, and what is, fr uh, the, what is the interest of France, what is the EU interest? There are competing interests within the EU. The EU is not always a coherent actor in its foreign policy making, and particularly not in this area. Lack of institutional procedures for lessons learned and best practices quite good at horizontal learning, but even more crucial is a vertical up uptake of lessons learned on the ground. And here the EU is facing huge problems, learning from th the vertical uptake of learning made on the ground and how that filters up to the, uh, to the headquarter level. There's serious problems with this. And a lack of coordination and division of labor with other actors on the ground, uh, which also often results in a training fatigue among uh, those that are supposed to be trained by external interventions. The implementation perception gaps. From the various case studies, we have learned that conflict sensitivity is still not a key concern in the implementation of EU crisis response. And this is also confirmed by a text mining web scraping study we have done on a large number of EU documents. The Union likes to talk about conflict sensitivity, but, uh, but that is more in talks and so on. In its actual sort of papers on programming, conflict sensitivity is seldom referred to. And studying the language used in connection to the crisis and conflict where the EU is engaged shows that the Union's repertoire toolbox in crisis uh, response corresponds to three different agendas. It corresponds to a hard security agenda, a soft security agenda, and an integration agenda. And this very much overlaps with the various spaces of EU foreign policy making, as you will see in a second. That's why we believe that it's possible here, in fact, yeah. despite all this talk about normative superpower, cosmopolitan superpower, uh, soft superpower, in fact, to talk about a move towards a more realist approach in EU crisis response. It's a trend towards, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, this comparison here because it will simply take uh, too much time, but uh, uh, in the handouts that was out there, I mean, you can look into this uh, yourself. It's a trend towards an increased attention on security over uh, integration in both the enlargement area and the neighborhood area. In the wider neighborhood area, that is the Sahel, the security agenda is dominant and there is also a tendency that hard security measures are getting more attention. And when security and stabilization becomes the driving force, issues concerning conflict sensitivity may also become much less of an importance to the EU. And we believe that this is bad also if you're only interested in a hard security agenda, in fact. So if we then turn to the Sahel, the EU and Mali Sahel, towards a more realist approach, question was Mark. As I already mentioned, I mean, this area is higher than ever on the EU agenda. We have Operation Barkhane with a heavy involvement from France and also other European countries are either in fact joining in, like Denmark, 
or planning to join in, um, or France at least is hoping that other countries are planning to uh, join in, and Macron is probably trying to also capitalize a little bit in this regard on uh, recent, at least so far, quite successful G7 meeting. We have MINUSMA, EUTM, that's the EU uh, Union Training Mission, EU CAP Sahel, plus a number of other uh, multilateral and bilateral programs. I mean, the area is now completely... I mean, there is so many programs going on here right now uh, that I don't think anybody really have the full overview of what is actually going on. However, despite all this attention and despite all this money being spent, although well, mo most of this money is not being spent in the Sahel, it's spent on paying salaries and travel costs and these kind of things. But still, I mean, the attention has never been higher. The international engagement has never been deeper. But as Mali shows, this is not going the right way. In Mali from 2013 to 2019, the crisis is deeper and it's spread from the north where it started in 2012 to the central region, which is much more important for Mali because this is uh, the potential breadbasket. This is where everybody, all the important ethnic groups in Mali meets. And it spills over to neighboring countries like Burkina Faso and Niger. Niger is still showing a slightly higher degree of resilience to this. Burkina is melting down very rapidly, very wor worryingly. The question that can be asked is, has a multidimensional crisis been reduced to European security, uh, regime security? Because it's very clear what Europe, at least immediate goals, is here. Fewer migrants and less jihadi rebels and traffickers. This is the primary EU interest in this part of the world. But then the question also can also be asked, is this really what the Sahel needs? And I'm not naive here. I'm not saying that we don't need a military approach to a military security approach to jihadi rebels. I'm not saying that we should just open up the borders and let uh, everybody who wants to leave this area and everybody who wants to use this area to transit to Europe just, just come. That is simply not possible. But the problem is that this particular primary concern may lead to a neglect of trying to deal with some of the underlying causes of both migration and conflict in this area, and that is the lack of development, the lack of jobs. This is one of the most youthful regions in the world. You have all these young people with uh, extremely high aspirations who doesn't see any future here. It's not necessarily that they're going to starve to death, but it's just this feeling of all possibilities of social progress being completely blocked, knowing that, okay, I can live in this village, but then I know that the rest of my life is going to be exactly like uh, today. That makes quite a lot of people thinking about going. It makes some of these planning to go, and yet some of them actually going. What the Sahel really needs, it needs better security, but, in a but security needs to come together with development, jobs, and try starting to prepare this region for the climate change resilience that will be needed in the future because this is one of the regions of the world that will be the hardest hit by climate change. And a uh, global temperature uh, increase of two to four uh, degrees is dramatic in Norway. We'll see more of the kind of weather that we're seeing today in the Sahel. We will, we will be able to deal with this. In the Sahel, this will be a humanitarian disaster of enormous proportions. And I'm quite afraid of what's going to happen here if you're not able to address this situation quicker and better. If we look at the EU crisis response in the Sahel, it's technical. It's very much ma based on Brussels-made made mandates, meaning again that the vertical uptake of lessons learned on the ground is way too little. The EU is often involved in what is called building civilian capabilities, meaning that it's not the EU is not sort of on the forefront of Operation Barkhan and these kind of very sort of very sort of strict anti-terror activities, but it's more with regard to police reform, judicial reforms, or security sector reform that has been one of the primary occupations of the EU. Its official goal is to seek a long-term commitment and to have a light footprint. What we find is, is much more short-term linked to immediate priorities in Europe, where it teleports experts into the field 
heavy personal rotation. Most often staff is not spending more than six months in the field. And little attempt to establish institutional memory. The EU needs to become much better at developing country and area expertise, meaning that it needs to have people longer in the field and it needs to have rotation arrangements. That means that not almost the entire mission leave at the same time. These are quite easy things to deal with. And I'm often quite surprised that it sort of comes as a shock that is this what we are doing? Because uh, this is what is, uh, what is happening on the ground, is that people teleport in six months, very little preparations. And when they finally, after sort of five months, start to figure out that this was not that easy as it was seemed from a presentation in Brussels, well then it's about time to leave. And there is very little uptake, vertical uptake of lessons learned on the ground. It has communication difficulties, as already mentioned. Local stakeholders often fail to understand what the EU seeks to accomplish. And the EU, like <laughs> most other external partners, fails to recognize that work in fragile states comes with certain specific challenges due to the weak response capacity in such countries. In order to utilize external support in its current form, what is needed is administrative capacity at least some sort of political legitimacy. And unfortunately, most of the Sahelian states suffer in both regards. And if external actors want to have a lasting impact, it needs to figure out how to increase both administrative capacity, but also how to boost the political legitimacy of the regimes that it seeks to support. If not, what we are facing is basically that we stay here for a very long time. We may avoid collapse, but we just end up hooking Sahelian states on an artificial international life support system. And there is no sustainability in that beyond the missions themselves, which may very well lead this into becoming more or less endless missions, like the current UN mission in the Congo. And nobody really thinks today that that is a very good idea. But we are, in, we are in the process of repeating that mistake in the Sahel. The information local ownership gap in the Sahel. I mean, there is some positive here. Because when you talk to people who are able to separate France from the EU, for example, they have a relatively good impression of the EU. I mean, if you talk to local people in Mali about France, I mean, there is all these, there is all these conspiracy uh, stories that come up about how France, uh, Macron, wants to balkanize Mali in order to take the natural uh, riches of the north. Well, I mean, for the first, there is no natural riches in the north. And there has never been a France-French uh, plan to balkanize Mali. And uh, I'm very certain that uh, <laughs> Macron doesn't have one. So, I mean, this is just things that happen because people don't understand actually what is going on and, and why things are not improving when they see a lot of international actors on the ground. Most people do not have that kind of thoughts about the EU. They think that the EU is relatively well intended. But they're also unaware and really don't understand its policies and its programming. And this points to a de democratic deficit as important decisions are taken by an external stakeholders that may not be well understood or debated locally. And our respondents often claim that the EU activities lack impact and sustainability due to the combination of limited resources and a lack of understanding of the situation on the ground. And this is also very clear and because what we see here is a very clear lack of collaboration with the Malian partners. Again, officially the EU's aim is a light footprint model in close col collaboration and consultation with local partners. What we find is that the most obvious light footprint is the attempt to let the countries of the Sahel do the job of improved border management and fighting jihadists uh, and traffickers. This is the most obvious light footprint that basically what we're trying to do is to encourage, pay, force them to do something that we really don't want to do. The level of consultation and real dialogue with Sahel civil society and other actors on the ground, for example, local communities, is minimal. There are several reasons for this. One is how the EU operates. 
top-down from Brussels, very much based in the belief that Brussels' priorities are universally shared and that European models can be transplanted to the Sahel. Another is risk aversion. In the mandate itself, but also the refusal to deal with local CSO. It's this sort of stay away attitude that is very strong here. That it's dangerous to be become too deeply engaged with local communities, both because it's in as dangerous in itself and the EU is extremely risk averse. The other is the, the kind of risk averse that has to do with corruption. And I mean, it cannot be denied. I mean, Mali is a very corrupt country, and parts of the civil society organizations are also corrupted. But staying away from them, refusing to deal with them, d does not necessarily make this any better. And it's a lot of frustrations uh, among Malian CSOs concerning this, because current EU regulations concerning size of annual running budget of a CSO disqualifies almost all Malian CSOs and the only one that are left in this game that can really operate together with the EU and also receive financial support are the large international ones that, that are then presented as local because they have their local organizations in Mali, but they're not really local CSO, they are international ones. So I'm coming towards the end now, Kari. So it's a lot of money spent, but few results. And uh, let me here just sort of very briefly delve into the EUTM. The EUTM has been in operation in Mali since 2013 now. And it's an attempt really to train an army or retrain an army that is for all practical purposes is fully operational at war. And this is in fact a gigantic experiment that uh, at least as far as I know has never been attempted before. And as an argument, as an informant argued to us, what this shows is that Mali has become a lab laboratory for EU crisis response policies. And he was not very happy about this. I mean, there is good reasons for trying to strengthen the Malian army. But how can you evaluate and monitor your training when you cannot follow the troops into the field? So what we are left with is a relatively huge operation, costs a lot of money, which is where very extremely competent European officers end up being extremely frustrated by giving training to the Malian army and Malian officers particularly, without being able to do proper evaluation and monitoring. And the only way to do proper man, uh, evaluation and monitoring of troops is to follow them into the battlefield and see what they actually are doing. So the only proof we have right now is that the conflict itself is closer to Bamako than ever before. So obviously there's something wrong here at with the parts of the more operational tra combat training. Secondly, EUTM spends also considerable attention to human rights programming and these kind of things in the operations of the army. If you look at the little we know about the human rights records of the Malian army, it's, it's not improving. It's just to have a take a look at the Amnesty International reporting and other kinds of quite independent third party reporting from the battlefields and you see that. Obviously, there is something that is not working here, but we really don't know why it's not working, because there is absolutely no monitoring and evaluation reports that can be taken seriously. So what this ends up with is, unfortunately, a mismatch between what Sahel needs and what the EU needs. Brussels seems to think its priorities are universal. In the case of Sahel, they are A, preventing uh, migration, fighting jihadi rebels. To achieve this, the, uh, Europe is currently building dams in the Sahel, but we are not building visible dams. We are not as, uh, we are not as President Trump who brags about building a wall, building a wall that he will never be able to build, most likely. We are building more in invisible walls and dams in the Sahel with local regime partners. This is what is currently going on. 
And not all of this is bad. I'm not saying all of this is bad. We need, to, we need both short-term and long-term so solutions, but very little of this is debated. We have a huge debate in Norway and Europe about uh, Trump's supposed wall towards Mexico. What we are doing in North Africa and the Sahel is something that we seemingly prefer not to talk about or really don't want to know about. So it's much better to sort of have this, you know, demonize somebody else for something he probably will never be able to do rather than look, in, uh, look at ourselves and what we are doing and have a proper debate about this, an open democratic debate about what we actually are doing and what we are trying to achieve and if we will achieve it with current uh, approaches. So my question is, this is all not only a question of what the Sahel needs, but also if current EU approaches which will serve Europe well in the long run. And I'm not so, not so certain that they will. They may have given liberal regimes in Europe a breather because we have been able to close down most of the large migration waves through, uh, through the Sahel. We have been able to do that. But for how long will this dam hold? There is a very important dam now called Niger and the regime in Niamey. How long will it hold? And what, we, what will we do if it doesn't hold anymore? Because if you build a dam without having gates that can be open every now and then, either up front or back again, well, I mean, sooner or later that dam will be, filled, will be full. And then something is going to happen in Niger. Something is going to happen in this region if you don't come up with more long-term solutions to this. So the danger is that while current approaches might prevent state collapse, it will keep Sahel countries on an artificial system of international support, life support, that may make current EU missions into endle endless ones as no downscaling or exit options emerge. And then let me end by uh, oops. <coughs> the two last slides. What we point to in this project more generally is what we call five paradoxes of EU crisis response. Local ownership is not very much local. It is in fact seeking support of political elites rather than people on the ground. And this is not unique to the EU. This is what everybody is doing, but it's still worth pointing out. EU crisis response is a Brussels-based design with limited sensitivity for local context or root causes of conflict, and it needs to become better at this. EU interests, not local demands, increasingly drive crisis response, and we need to find a better match between them. I'm not saying that the EU shouldn't have interest. We all have interest, and it's fair and it's good to have interest, but we need to find a better way of aligning European interest and EU interest with local interest on the ground. This is what this is all about. Of course we should have interest. Everybody has interest. Somebody who say that, uh, that he, she or, he, or he, he or she's organization doesn't have interest is basically either stupid or is lying. Everybody has interest. And one should have interest and one should acknowledge the interest one has. Narrow security, uh, security concerns rather than and, uh, addressing underlying structural issues and a short-term conflict management instead of long-term solutions. These are the current paradoxes of EU crisis response in general. And then finally, five policy recommendations. The EU needs to get a better grip on what the real needs of the people on the ground are, and the EU needs to establish contacts with local CSOs and non-traditional sources of knowledge and information, including religious actors. The EEAS must start to institutionalize systematic procedures for vertical lessons learned. There is a good number of frustrated and smart people who work on EU missions on the ground who are extremely frustrated about this. This systematic inability to create institutional memory on the various level of EU crisis response management from the national missions and upwards. But this is particularly salient and important in the national missions, that you need to be able to establish an institutional memory of what, what works, what doesn't work, what is this uh, all about, what can we do, what are the constraints, what, what can we not do. 
Instead, that missions constantly start reinventing the wheel, trying to understand Mali, Niger, Mauritania, and so on and so forth. The EU must recognize. Oh, okay. Also, need to combine short term uh, crisis response with more long term engagement to avoid unintended consequences. There needs to be a stronger focus not only in the EU, but in among all international actors on unintended consequences. We need to have a stronger focus on the do no harm maxim that seems to vanish away as we are, that we believe in our liberal uh, values and rights and that they will never threaten anything that is local. That is not the, not the fact. We need to become much more aware of the unintended consequences of what we are doing. The EU must recognize that its priorities, notably the fight against terrorism and halting migration, are not necessarily aligned with the interests of various segments of local populations. And it needs to be better at combining short-term crisis response with more long-term en engagement to avoid unintended consequences. This is basically what we in May presented in Brussels. And I'm quite happy to say that, I mean, over quite strong criticism has been quite well received in Brussels and uh, that is at least gives me some hope that we have been able if nothing else to start some kind of rethinking of current uh, processes of how this is being done by Brussels by the uh, European Union and if we have achieved at least a glimmer of that uh, this free year and uh, some millions of euros spent on this project may have been worth it so thank you for coming here. So, thank you so much, Morten. A great uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, so we have um, 15 minutes, 17 minutes. Uh, Morten has to run then, and we are going into another meeting, some of us. But So, I will ask you to please be a bit brief, although Morten was lengthy, but this is why you came here, I'm sure. So, if you can be a little bit brief when you ask your questions and come with your comments, but I would also ask you to state your name and institutional affiliation when you get the microphone. So, please, the floor is open. Gentlemen behind there, please. My name is Carlo Kose. I'm from the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen. Um, I would be interested if you believe that uh, the way aid is delivered to uh, countries in the Sahel zone, that the mode of delivery, how it is, how local um, institutions, traditionally, traditional communal groups and citizens are involved in planning and uh, whether uh, aid programs are designed and delivered transparent, whether that could enhance the positive impact of not only the European Union's aid, but also like aid in general. Okay, thank you so much. While the rest of you think of your question and comment, I will uh, ask you, Martin, to, to answer that one, please. Yeah, I'll try. Um, I mean, we aid is, of course, I mean, uh, of importance because this is an area that needs aid. But I do think that we need to find better ways of sort of aligning aid and aid delivery to, to what are the to what are real local needs and we also need to become better at understanding that certain uh, particularly emergency relief and humanitarian uh, relief needs to be very quickly sort of faded away in order not to destroy local markets and then you need a very fine-tuned understanding of what is actually going on on the ground and how these local markets are working. Uh, sometimes we have that, other times not. Um, the problem, of course, with all these things now in, in, the, in the Sahel is the is, uh, and particularly in Mali and uh, the north and the central region is the security situation that makes it very difficult to engage locally. And the question is, of course, and this is the difficult one, I mean, sort of, how do you achieve the level of security where you can have that kind of meaningful dialogue with local stakeholder groups? Right now, I mean, that is extremely dangerous for local stakeholder groups because whereas the MINUSMA and Barkhana and the Malian army at times are able to push 
the jihadi rebels away. We are not a really able to secure the area, meaning that if we then come in, uh, we, meaning international actors, come in with this desire to engage, even if that uh, desire is real, to engage with local groups. I mean, th that will be immensely dangerous for them, and they, and they know that. So many of them prefer to stay away from that engagement because they know that uh, groups like the Katiba Masina in the central Mali, they will have informants and spies in these uh, areas and they will know who then collaborated with, uh, with the enemy and people are getting killed after this. So I mean you need to find a way in this particular area to combine stabilization which will in have to involve military stabilization in the short run with humanitarian dialogue and development dialogue that makes people feel secure enough to enter into that dialogue. And this is of course from the debates about I mean how to sort of that kind of collaboration between security actor and humanitarian and development actor. I mean that that has never been easy and it's difficult, but I don't see any way around trying to rethink that because I mean as long as the instability and conflict continues, that kind of dialogue is not possible. So how do we solve that? And uh, that's one of these million dollar questions in this uh, part of the world, unfortunately. I, don't, I, I cannot come up with a better answer sort of on the spot. Thank you. There is a gentleman here. My name is Ivan Hoffman. Having been involved with the European Migration Network for a number of years, I found that your presentation on the issues uh, facing both the European Union and uh, the Mali and Sahel authorities very interesting and convincing. However, I would like to ask you to what extent do you think that the internal conflicts within the European Union, mem between the European member countries, uh, contribute to the lack or, or the weaknesses in the EU responses that you uh, highlighted and to what extent can the issues that you outlined be resolved without having changes to the migration policies of the EU opening some of the gates in the some gates in the dam at the most at the moment the only gate which looks as if it's open is the refugee migration gate and we all know that that is an extremely narrow gate. Thank you. I, I wonder, Martin, shall we take a few more? Yeah, please do. So, Ma Maria? So Maria gabrielson Jambert from PRIO and Director of the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. Thank you for a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering a bit uh, if you could address this. It seems there is a sort of a tension between the fact that the Sahel has become a high priority for the EU because of uh, counterterrorism and be be in, in order to prevent uh, migration. But at the same time, as you described very well, there's this lack of actual engagement in a way of, of uh, to really engage with understanding the situation on the ground and, and perhaps I even letting in a way the Sahel countries do the border control for the EU. So, so, yeah, so in a way there's a tension between having become a high priority uh, while at the same time delegating it to to, to the countries in the region. So if you could uh, yeah, say a little bit more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, do you want to take one more? Yeah, please. Yeah. So the gentleman there, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Rolf Rehr. I was uh, frequently in, in, in Nigeria and Abe in the period 2012 to 16. And uh, my question uh, to you is that uh, do you, I mean, I, I sense that there are underlying trends here in, in Niger in particular that has not come to or to, to, to total doom. Um, and what we have seen th through the building of the dam is that in uh, Agadez, uh, four, five, six thousand direct uh, jobs have disappeared. Hundred uh, thousand uh, people have uh, lost some of their income. Uh, we have seen how uh, poor people in Niger have been used to, to some of them to, to travel to Algiers and, and Libya to, to find work in, in seasons. They cannot travel there anymore because of 
uh, that shut down that has been stimulated by the EU, uh, uh, by the, the government of uh, North Africa. So, <laughs> can uh, a technical approach to, to development cooperation or aid in any way replace all these linkages of uh, common political economic interest and, and patronage that this system have, has carried and has been so essential for the, uh, the, uh, the governance of Niger f for such a long time. Does EU or Niger really stand a chance in this setting? Thank you. So, Morten, please. Yeah, I think I'll start with the last one, and unfortunately, Rolf, I have to be uh, brief on this because time is running out. But I mean, uh, in another project, uh, Fragment uh, Fragile States uh, and Violent Entrepreneurs, which uh, both me and Kari is involved in, we are having a, quite a huge focus on these issues in Niger, and we are returning to Niger uh, in October, November uh, to continue work we started there uh, last year. Um, and I mean, uh, no there is no technical solution to this. I mean, what you need is rather a grand political compromise of some sort, which uh, will be hard to swallow both for uh, people and regimes in the Sahel, but also for people and regimes in, uh, in Europe. Because uh, I think that Europe and the Sahel need, and North Africa needs to understand that it, it lives in, a common sh in, in the shadow of a common destiny. And what happens in the Sahel will have huge repercussions for Europe and vice versa. And th that has not really dawned on people yet, that we need, that we are in a common boat there. And we need to sort of find a way of navigating what will be extremely difficult and stormy weathers. Um, when it comes to Agadez became a gold rush. Suddenly people were making money in Agadez, uh, or at least much more money that they, uh, that they, than they had been making for decades. And then suddenly, when the EU really re realized what was happening in 2016, it really put the screws on the regime of Niamey, with among other things, I mean this new anti-trafficking law that I believe is, uh, is a blatant violation of the ECOWAS Treaty on free movement that uh, uh, Niger had constitutionally ratified. So. Uh, Basically, what the EU has pushed through is probably unconstitutional. At least there are several of my Nigerian colleagues who think so, including uh, constitutional lawyers. But that's an other, other matter. More, even more important is probably, and worrying is that, uh, I mean, as you also know, Rolf, I mean, Eli uh, since 2011 with the Isufu and Bazoum, I mean, Niger is a quite a carefully constructed elite compromise which has, and they've been able to build a stronger castle in the sand than, for example, Mali. Much stronger. They have been more uh, resilient. But that resilience may not be, uh, be undermined with some of the EU policies on Agadez. Because who was benefiting from what was happening in Agadez? It was a Tuareg elite that used to be among the forefront of the Nigerian uh, Mumapur Justice, a rebel movement that, that fought in this area in 2007 to 2009. Unraveling this elite compromise is neither in Europe's interest, nor in the interest of Niger and Niamey. It should be supported. Okay, Ni uh, Agadez could not continue to be the transit migrant capital of not only Africa, but Middle East. Uh, I mean, people from Bangladesh, from all over the world, was pa passing through this area. This could not continue. But if you want to sort of turn your screw and close something like that, you need to come in with other measures, basically to keep people who know the area, who know how to use arms, and for a while now have earned very good money, we have to keep them happy, not unhappy, because this is what is happening. They have become extremely unhappy because they were promised quite a lot of support to these various organizations. And here, I mean, what we call traffickers are people who see themselves as transport companies, and they are organized in various sort of professional associations, in fact, and they were promised quite a lot of support. That has never materialized. And that is extremely short-sighted. And we, then we have to talk more about Niger at another time. Um, but this also relates to your question about weakness in the European management. And unfortunately, I think that what we saw in 2014-2015 
was a Europe that at least at that crucial point in uh, history was not fit for uh, the future. Because Europe could have dealt much better with this by trying to set an example of a global actor that wanted to create a global quota system. Because th that global quota system is needed. That's the only way to really deal with the current situation. First, we need to find a way of better separating, between, in my point of view, between uh, refugees and migrants. Um, both of them needs to be recognized as a crisis, but they shouldn't be recognized as the same crisis because it's not. You need to deal with the refugees as refugees and migrants and migrants. You need to separate these two. Right now, it's everything is washed, visually washed together, and that also creates um, very un unfruitful debates about all of this because people really don't understand why, why, are, why are, who is a refugee, who is a migrant. We need to become better at separating between this and find means of dealing with both of these crises, but they cannot and should not be dealt with with the same tools which we are currently are doing in my point of view. And Europe could have taken a lead here, unfortunately, and I think that Merkel could have bec been much stronger in these internal debates, particularly with the Visegrad countries. But she was afraid of really trying to carry that mantle and instead just created the kind of chaos that we saw when, she, uh, when it was opened up and then closed and then came the deal with Turkey, which comes with a whole uh, load of uh, troubles itself because it, uh, it showed the power of a potential swing door country when it comes to uh, <laughs> migrant management towards Europe. So there's a lot of issues here that Europe needs to get its acts together in order to try to become a leader and not sort of just and being proactive and not just reactive in this regard. Finally, um, uh, Maria, I mean, yes, ideally, I mean, this would be about the kind of delegation and uh, finding a way of work sharing with these countries because that is needed. But then you need a much, gra uh, much larger political compromise uh, which also involves uh, economic issues, which involves travel arrangements, which involves uh, a number of issues that needs to be worked out and not everybody cannot get what they want there. I mean, freedom of movement is simply impossible. On the other hand, closing everything off here is not possible either. And then you, if, you, if you can get the various sides to realize that neither of these sort of extreme options are possible, but that you need to find other means of dealing with this, then that grand compromise would be possible. And there may be, s at least among certain Sahel countries like Niger, an interest in actually reacting to such a grand compromise. Um, but the problem is that there is no unity on the European side of such a grand compromise because some people, uh, some countries actually don't think that that is very much needed because they don't think they will be uh, very much hurt by what is happening in the Sahel. They, it hasn't really dawned on European actors how dangerous the situation in the Sahel is and what kind of repercussions it also could have for European security. And until we realize that, I don't think we'll get that kind of debate about the delegation, about that grand compromise. Unfortunately, I'm supposed to be somewhere else at 10.30 to <laughs> talk about <laughs> some of these similar issues to the Europa Bewegelsen, who is having uh, their security seminar today. And uh, the I probably should not have said uh, yes to both of them, but I ended up doing that, and then I just have to run now. So sorry about that, but <coughs> thanks for being here. and engaging with us and um, yeah, Kari. And thanks to you, Morten, for, for being here with us and presenting. And um, we will have more seminars on this topic, um, both in this autumn and, and next coming years, because as Morten, Morten mentioned, we have several projects ongoing on this very same uh, topic area. So thank you very much to all of you. Thanks to Morten and please join me uh, in a big hand of applause.